Moses is a 14-year-old boy living in a fishing village beside Lake Kariba in Zimbabwe. He wants to go to school, but chooses to help his family with fishing instead of studying. He has a younger sister named Zyra, who is nine years of age, whom he takes to an elementary school every day. He also has a younger brother named Roni, who he brings to a primary school near Zyra's elementary school. Moses has been a good and obedient son in his family. He has been hands-on with his siblings and assists his parents with fishing instead of studying. The other people in their village look up to him, and he is also Zyra and Roni's role model. One day, Zyra and Roni told Moses that they had no classes and wanted to spend time with their brother. Moses was delighted with the news and said to his parents he would excuse himself from fishing today because he wanted to bond with his siblings. His parents agreed and told him to watch his siblings closely. Moses, Zyra, and Roni headed outside the village and played near some trees. It's been a long time since they went out to play without any homework or school to worry about. The three of them enjoyed each other's company until they decided to rest under a huge tree. Moses told his two siblings that he'd head home to get them some snacks, to which the two agreed. He told Zyra and Roni not to go anywhere, and the two nodded to agree with him. While Moses was gone, Zyra and Roni started to play and run around the giant tree where they'd been resting. They were getting very loud until they heard something roar at a distance. Zyra asked Roni if he was the one who shouted, to which the child answered that he couldn't roar like that. The two children stopped playing as they observed the sound, and it was coming from a nearby bush. Roni became curious and wanted to check it out, but Zyra stopped him and told him it could be a wild animal. Roni insisted, and Zyra agreed that they should get near the bushes to hear the noise. The boy decided that they should tiptoe their way to the bushes. Meanwhile, Moses got some snacks and drinks for Zyra and Roni when he heard a scream from outside the village. He immediately recognized Zyra's voice, making him drop the food and run to where they were. To his surprise, he saw a lioness grabbing Zyra by the waist and dragging her away, making him scream in terror. He immediately ran to Zyra and the lioness and tried to punch and kick the animal in the face and body. Roni was sitting on the ground and gripping his knees, shaking in terror at what he saw. Moses tried to grab and hold his sister away from the lioness's bite. Zyra continued to cry as she could feel the pain of getting bitten and pawed by the lioness. Moses was repeatedly kicking and punching the lioness to scare it away, which resulted in the lioness letting go of Zyra and tackling him down to the ground instead. Zyra immediately grabbed Roni and ran back to the village to get help, leaving Moses with the lioness on top of him. The lioness bites Moses' face, causing it to bleed and leave a massive open wound. Moses pushes the lioness away and punches it in the face, attempting to hurt it and scare it away. The lioness roared more as it pawed and bit Moses' shoulders and arms. His parents arrived with other villagers carrying torches and huge stones a few minutes later. Moses' father approached the lioness and threw several large stones to hurt it. The lioness bawled out in pain and attempted to attack his father when he swayed a fire torch across the animal's face. The lioness roared once again before running back to the wild, leaving Moses bloodied and unconscious. The villagers then took Moses to a nearby medical center to treat his injuries. Zyra was also taken there due to the lioness's bites on her waist and leg, but she miraculously survived. Authorities were now searching for the lioness that attempted to take the lives of Moses and Zyra. The story was noted in Kisala, Kenya, and concerns a teenager inches from certain death at the claws of a rogue lioness that wandered a great way away from its pride. Amari was 16 years old at the time of the attack and was enjoying his free day from school in the company of his friends. One borrowed their parents' car and they decided to drive over to Ikutha, a small nearby town, to hang out. They spent the day there and bought some groceries so the friend's father would not be too upset about borrowing the car without permission. Borrowing a car like that was commonplace where Amari was from and they were more than used to it. 
They spent most of their day enjoying their own company. There were four of them in total. After their outing, the teenagers decided they had had enough and it was time to head back to town. Everything was going well, aside from Damu, the group's driver, noticing that something wasn't quite right with the car. It was jittery and he seemed to slightly lose control of the steering. However, it quickly sorted itself out and they resumed their journey. Damu dropped each of his friends off individually, with the Mari being his last stop. He lived at the very edge of the village and would usually be last whenever they agreed to meet up somewhere. The pair were best friends and Damu never minded dropping his friend off at his house, no matter how angry his father would get about the car. As they neared Amari's house, the issues with the car started up again, and the boys heard the engine get louder as they picked up speed, as if the accelerator was being pressed. Damu had his foot off the gas. He pressed the brakes with everything he had, but they weren't working, and they did not dare to jump out as it was going too fast. They could only fasten their seatbelts and hope Damu could slow it down. The car sped along the path and right past Amari's house moving further and further along until it came crashing off the road and into some bushes and small trees off the main road. Amari and Damu were dizzy from the blow as the car's bumper met the tree before them, but they were not injured. As soon as the car stopped, Damu started screaming about his father and the consequences of crashing the car, while Amari flopped out of the passenger side and onto the ground, panting horribly. Although he did not know it then, he was having a panic attack because of the crash and didn't know what was happening. Scared, he tried to stand up, but his legs wouldn't work. Only after Damu calmed down and noticed his friend in need did he step out and help him. It took 15 minutes, but eventually Amari managed to calm down. They stood up and looked around. The sun was setting quickly and they had to do something, but phones were a luxury that could not be afforded then so their best bet was to walk back home and face the consequences. As they turned back to walk, they were met by the single most frightening sight in their lives, which they would never forget. A massive lioness was standing in front of them. It took a threatening stance and growled as it slowly paced forward. The boys could only stand in place, petrified, as they didn't expect a lion to be so close to their village. They had seen them before, but it was always in the nearby reserve, and they never dared to approach one, remembering their parents' warnings. Damu grabbed Amari's arm above the elbow and mumbled in whispers, asking him what they should do. Amari could only respond in the same way, but he ended up saying one thing. The car. Synchronized and free from fear as the lioness moved even closer, they sprinted and ran toward their car, about 15 yards away. Immediately as they did, they could hear the thumping of paws and the growl of the lioness as it gave into the chase. The boys whimpered and screamed as they ran, but ultimately, Amari could not outrun one of the most dangerous predators in the world. The lioness caught up to them, latched onto Amari, and both tumbled. Amari fell on his back, and the first thing he saw when he opened his eyes was the maw of the lion approaching his face and the car's rear bumper in his peripheral vision. They were so close. He could feel the lion's claws dig into his chest as its mouth bit into his arms right as he pulled them up to his face to protect himself. He screamed in pain and instinctively kicked with his legs, but to no avail. He later noted that it was as if he was kicking a wall. That's how large this lioness was. As it gnawed on Amari's arms, Damu froze in fear, screaming all the while. Only when Amari screamed for help did his body seem to act independently, and he spotted a large rock not too far from the car. It was quite heavy, heavier than what Damu should have been able to lift, but the adrenaline was stronger. He heaved the rock above his head and sent it flying toward the lion. He managed to strike it in the back, between the shoulder blades. It was enough to cause it to stumble back. Damu seized the opportunity to grab Amari by his collar and help him to his feet, and they both booked it for the car. They clambered inside, and Damu shut the door behind them, just in time as the lion's full weight came crashing down on them. It clawed at the door and growled immensely, 
but it did not manage to get in. It sat in front of the door, staring both of the boys down. Damu stared back at the lion, and Amari still screamed in pain due to his wounds. They were bleeding, but not enough to warrant concern for blood loss. They sat in the car for about five minutes, at which point they heard shouting from down the main road and saw a crowd of people with farming implements shouting. They heard the screams and came to help the boys. Seeing the crowd of people did not deter the lioness at first, but as they got closer, she ended up running away in the opposite direction, limping slightly from the force of the rock that Damu threw. Damu opened the car door to the image of his father standing wide-eyed and skeptical about the damage to his car. Still, he softened when he saw Amari's wounds and urged someone to help him carry him back to the village. They arrived within 15 minutes, and the village doctor was on standby. He tended to Amari's wounds and told him he would be fine. Some locals called the authorities and dispatched a group from Nairobi to come and relocate the lion. They found it after two days, and it was reunited with its pride some 20 miles away from the site of the incident. They noted that it was strange for a lion to wander so far away from its pride, but assured them they would not see it again. However, this did not stop the village residents from always walking in groups when venturing beyond its edge. Today's story takes us to the Ngorongoro district of Tanzania. Drawing its name from the spectacular Ngorongoro crater, one of the world's largest calderas, the conservation area was a sight to behold. With a brimming mix of highlands, forests, savanna woodlands, and plains, the district was one which attracted sightseeing tourists and also served as a conservation area for threatened species. Gazelles, wildebeest, zebras, and many more called the area their home. But of all creatures who lived in the location, one stood out above the rest, a big cat who was the true king of the jungle. Leonard and Raphael had traveled all the way from San Francisco for their amateur attempt at a YouTube channel. They had saved up and traveled down to Tanzania, getting a place where they would live for a few weeks. And during their stay, they would head out to the plains and savannah and make videos of animals in hopes of capturing something which would make their lives a little more comfortable. Three days into their expedition, and they had only been able to follow a pack of wildebeest who grazed slowly in the savannah. In the first week of following the herd, they were lucky enough to capture footage of a female wildebeest giving birth to her young. It was a moving moment for the videographers, and they took home the content, polishing it in hopes that they would make more out of it. They went out as often as they could, most times camping out just a few hundred meters from the herd, making sure they would never miss a moment. The new star of their show was the young wildebeest, as it learned to walk and run faster than any human child would ever know. A few weeks in, and the duo drove back to their usual spot, looking for the creatures. They were roaming animals, and so they did not expect them to be in the same place. Following their trail, they found the herd further down at the end of a valley. They had paused in the valley to drink from the shallow river that flowed through it, and the videographers decided to set up shop at the top of the hill, not wanting to get too close, so they would not scare the beasts away. They zoomed in on the animals, watching them as they drank in the stream. The camera moved through them as Leonard and Raphael tried to find the young calf and its mother. As they searched, Raphael hit the gas on the car, causing Leonard to be jerked backwards. He stabilized himself and turned to ask why he was suddenly driving. But before he could ask, he realized that the herd had begun running, staying together, and rushing away from the water's edge as quickly as they could. Leonard held the camera as Raphael drove, staying with the creatures. Watching from the south, they realized that they had been running from a pack of wild dogs that had come hunting. The herd ran quickly, and their huge numbers made it hard for the wild dogs to get in and take them out. However, the dogs were in luck, as they were able to pick out a straggler who was not as fast as the rest of the herd, the newborn calf. The wild dogs pounced on it quickly going for its neck and suffocating the creature. In a matter of minutes, they were feasting on the carcass of the young wildebeest. Heartbroken by the events, 
Raphael and Leonard stayed on the scene for several hours, watching as the wild dogs ate until there was almost nothing left of the creature. As the sun went down, the predators left after having their fill. The videographers decided to get their close-up shot of the deceased animal and brought their vehicle close to where the rest of the carcass was left. In a way, it was their way of paying their last respects to a creature which they had grown attached to. By the time they were done for the day, it was too dark to begin heading home, and so they decided to set up their camp just a few hundred meters away. The night passed without event, but the early hours of the morning brought them a new phenomenon to behold. Standing by the carcass of the deceased animal was a lone wildebeest. The duo could only guess that the creature that had returned was the mother of the one killed by the wild dogs. It stood over the carcass, letting out a deep moaning cry, mourning the loss of its child. The sight moved the videographers to tears. In a bid to get their cameras out, they made too much noise, and the creature heard them, taking off instantly. Raphael believed that it was the clattering of their camera that had scared off the creature, but Leonard, who was standing right beside him, had a completely different idea. Behind them was a large female lion, its head reaching the chest of the men. It snarled at the men, upset that they had chased away what it had been stalking throughout the night. Raphael realized that the creature had changed its meal plan, and it had gone from wildebeest to human. Raphael took off running, leaving Leonard, who was frozen in terror, behind. The lioness pounced quickly, running faster than Leonard could even process the movements of the creature. In a matter of seconds, it had crossed the 200 meter distance between them, and had its large jaws around the neck of the man. Leonard opened his mouth to scream, and as the air escaped his lungs, the lioness pawed down on his stomach, gouging a hole in his lungs with a clean swipe of its paw. Raphael heard the beginnings of a scream, and then silence. He felt the wetness between his legs, but carried on as he ran. Fear fueled his flight, and he knew he just had to get to the safety of the van. Once he was in, he would start the engine and drive off and get some help. They would come back and help Leonard, but deep down, he knew his friend was dead already. Just as he got to the van, Raphael stopped himself just a few feet from it as another lioness leapt up on the roof of the vehicle. He screamed and turned to the right, trying to go around the creature. But there, in the middle of the grass, he saw the wagging tail of another with its eyes set on him. It dawned on him that the lions were social creatures, pack hunters, which meant that there was more than one lion on the hunt, and he had just been cornered by them. He turned around and bolted, running as fast as his legs could carry. He knew he would not be able to outrun them, and so he spotted a tree which was not too far away. If he could get to the tree, he would be able to get to safety. The sound of several lionesses chasing him reached his ears, and Raphael felt his heart in his mouth. He jumped higher than he ever had, grabbing onto a branch and pulling himself up into the tree in one swift move. He had executed the maneuver so well that he shocked himself, realizing just how far adrenaline could carry him. He laid flat against the branch, looking down at the four lionesses gathered at the bottom of the tree. A fifth was in the distance, dragging the body of Leonard toward the tree with a blood-red snout. Just as Raphael was about to cry out in fear, he felt the branch bend forward under the weight of something. He looked up, and without any question, he recognized it instantly. A lion, a lot bigger than the others down below. Its huge mane and powerful paws bounced slightly as the cat walked down the branch towards him. Raphael froze, not sure what to do. The lion reached him, licking his face first, and with a swipe of its paw, it smacked him off the branch, sending him falling to the ground down below. As his body made contact with the dirt, the teeth of the lioness made contact with his skin, drawing out a deathly scream that echoed across the savanna. Nadia is a local tour guide at a nature park in South Africa. The nature park offers many wildlife viewing opportunities for tourists, including a jeep safari and a walking safari. 
The Jeep Safari offers a safari tour taken by vehicle, and a walking safari is a popular option if tourists want to see the wild animals up close with the help of a guide. Nadia has been a tour guide for visitors taking the walking safari for years. She has already encountered many wild animals, both dangerous and not, in her job as a guide. Sometimes the nature park would be filled with tourists, and Nadia was forced to spend more hours on work than spending time for herself. Even though her job is dangerous, she loves doing it, and she's always captivated by meeting different wild animals up close. One day, a group of journalists came to the nature park to document the situation of wild animals under protection. They were offered a jeep safari tour, but refused. They said they wanted to try a walking safari tour to get proper documentation and witness these animals' situations. The nature park management agreed and got another guide, Makil, to accompany Nadia in guiding the journalists. They entered the walking safari trails as Nadia and Makil instructed the journalists about the animals they would encounter. Nadia and Makil ensured the tourists felt safe on the walking safari, since some were nervous about encountering wild animals such as rhinos or lions. Nadia assured them they had nothing to worry about, since they knew exactly what to do when a wild animal confronted them. As they were walking, the group walked past giraffes and elephants. The journalists were amazed as Makil informed them that the animals were in the best condition and that their natural habitats were still preserved while they were under protection. The journalists were pleased with their efforts as they continued walking the trail until an unexpected guest just came to greet them. A female lion, a lioness, can be seen walking past a huge tree in front of them. Nadia and Makil told the journalists to halt and get behind them while Nadia brought out her binoculars and saw a pride of lions ahead of them. A male journalist asked Nadia if they could leave immediately, but Nadia refused. She told the journalist they shouldn't run when seeing the lion up close, since it would only chase and attack them. Makil told the journalist to stay calm as the lioness slowly approached Nadia. Nadia told Makil and the journalist to stand firm and make themselves look big. Makil and the journalist followed as Nadia signaled them to scream at the top of their lungs and make loud noises to deter the animal. Nadia, Makil, and the journalist shouted as the lioness backed away. The journalists were relieved by the lioness slowly walking away from them, only to run as fast as it could and charge toward Nadia, jumping at her and taking her down to the ground. Makil and the journalists were shocked as the lioness slowly took over Nadia and started biting and pawing her in the face and head. Nadia screamed as she tried to push the animal away, but it was useless. Makil called for backup immediately as he approached Nadia and attempted to fight the lioness with his bare hands. The journalists were so scared that they just stood there, screaming in terror. The lioness isn't showing any signs of stopping as it continues to bite Nadia's face, head, shoulders, and arms. Blood was already flowing on Nadia's body as she could only scream in excruciating pain. Not long after, a team of guides with bear bangers and rifles arrived on a safari vehicle and set off a few bear bangers to produce loud noises and scare the lioness. The animal stopped attacking Nadia and was flinching as two guys approached and carried Nadia to the vehicle. They also brought the journalist into the car and fired two rifle warning shots to scare the animal away. Nadia was left with horrific wounds and injuries on her head, face, shoulders, and upper body. She was immediately brought to a hospital, and luckily, she survived. The lioness was now to be hunted and taken down to avoid attacking others in the future. The circus industry's use of wild animals in its shows has been a controversial topic across the globe over the years. As people become increasingly aware of the complications and dangers of putting wild animals in stressful situations, such as circuses, many have advocated against it already. Environmentalists, scientists, and experts have been complaining about wild animals in circuses for a long time. They've advocated that wild animals belong in their natural habitat and should not be used for entertainment. The public uproar was strong enough that some governments heard them 
and immediately banned wild animal use in circuses. However, there were only 40 countries that banned the use of wild animals, and the public longs for more change in other countries. Circuses still use animals for entertainment, since no bans are imposed in their countries. Carl is a young circus performer in a traveling circus in Germany. He knows about the public concern about using wild animals for entertainment and is fully aware of it. However, he still wants to come to work at the circus, since this is the only way he can get money to support himself to continue studying at the university. Carl bravely performed alongside animals such as monkeys, bears, and even lions at a young age. He has also helped tame the animals in their circus, especially their lion named Anton. Anton is a fully grown lion that was tamed since the age of one. Carl has helped the circus ringmaster Elias to tame the lion and teach it some tricks to impress the spectators coming into their circus to watch their shows. As the years go by, the number of spectators watching their shows has decreased due to the public outcry about banning circus animals. Carl, Elias, and the rest of the troupe were worried about their careers as their country could be banning circus animals anytime soon. Despite the circumstances, Carl and the other members of their troupe continued doing traveling shows with their animals, including Anton. The lion was the star of every show and spectators were amazed at its ability to obey and do tricks. One day, Elias informed the others that they'd travel to a town to perform there. Carl and the other troop members started to practice and train their animals, in which Carl decided to train Anton for their upcoming show. He ensures that Anton has been well-fed and in good condition before proceeding with the training to prevent any incidents and attacks. After the training, the troupe headed to the town where they'll be performing to gather spectators and start the show as soon as possible. Spectators of all ages came inside the circus tent to witness the performances they'll be showing them later. Carl stared at Anton in its cage for a few minutes before the show started. He suddenly felt saddened about Anton's condition while performing with the troupe and silently hoped he could get a real job outside the circus so the lion would no longer have to perform circus tricks. The show had already started, and the troop members began performing acrobatics, trapeze acts, and other stunts that amazed the audiences. When it was time for the main event, Carl took a deep breath and stepped into the stage before Elias freed Anton from its cage. The people were shocked to see a fully grown lion step into the stage with Carl and give them applause before their performance started. Carl smiles at the audience as he approaches Anton and pets its head like a dog. After that, Carl and Anton start doing basic tricks together. Every time Anton does some schemes, the crowd goes wild and wants to see more. For the final act, Carl brought out a giant hoop that Anton was supposed to jump through. Carl holds the large hoop with two hands and signals Anton to run and hop through it. Anton ran and successfully leaped through the ring, which amazed the people once more. Things drastically turn as Carl signals Anton to jump through the hoop again. Anton began to run, and instead of hopping through the hoop, it jumped straight to Carl and tackled him down on the stage floor. The spectators gasped, and some stood up to leave the circus tent after seeing the lion growl and attack Carl. Elias and the other troop members are surprised as they try to find a way to rescue Carl from Anton's attack. Meanwhile, Carl screamed in pain as the lion bit his head and pawed his face several times, making him bleed. The people began to panic as they fled from the circus tent and went outside to call for help. On the other hand, Carl was still brutally attacked by the lion when Elias grabbed his whip and beat Anton with it. Anton bawled out in pain as he continued to paw Carl's face and chest, hurting him badly. Elias repeatedly approaches Anton and beats it with the whip before the lion grunts and returns to its cage. An ambulance can be heard outside the tent a few minutes later, indicating that a spectator has called for Carl to be taken to the hospital. Elias and the troop members help carry Carl to the ambulance before sending him to a hospital for treatment. Carl fell unconscious after the attack and was severely injured and wounded. When the authorities heard of the news, a conservation center offered sanctuary for all of the circus troops' wild animals. 
especially Anton. The officials also recommended jobs for Elias, Carl, and the other troop members if they didn't want to continue circus work without using wild animals. Elias wanted to continue working in a circus without using wild animals, while Carl immediately decided to stop and continue his studies for good after his recovery. The attack eventually sparked the advocacy regarding banning wild animals in circuses even more and was used as an example that animals do not belong anywhere in the entertainment industry, but in the wild. Animal attacks in remote villages can be understood, especially since they are rare, and animals act out of instinct and desperation. However, it's an entirely different matter when people try to enter an animal's territory to provoke it. The next story is a report on an incident during a safari expedition in Zimbabwe, where Ulrich Peterson would find himself face to face with a lioness protecting her cubs. The incident took place in 1973 in an undisclosed location in Zimbabwe. A routine safari expedition carrying a dozen tourists and two jeeps was nearing a congregation point for a local pride of lions. The tourists had already seen rhinoceroses and zebras in the same location, only about 10 miles away from that point. Ulrich was in one of the jeeps with a couple of friends, all from Finland, who had decided to go around the world, with Africa being one of the destinations. On the day of their trip, Ulrich and his friends gathered at the meeting point where everyone else was already. The group consisted of people from all walks of life, from local teenagers to people their age and even elderly people enjoying their time in retirement. By all accounts, everything was going as planned. Ulrich noted how the guides were quite friendly and excited about the trip, telling everyone about the lions and how interesting they were, which excited the rest of the group. They commenced the trip after they had accounted for everyone, and it took about 45 minutes of driving before they saw their first lion. It was off in the distance, and the guides remarked how it was odd for a single lion to be there when they should usually roam with the pride, but they pressed on as their usual gathering point was still a ways off. It took another 20 minutes for them to reach the pride, and they were lounging around, the male at the front with the females spread out. When he got the idea to move the jeeps closer to the pride, the guides still talked about lions, spewing fun facts and everything he knew. Some tourists protested, but the guides ensured them that they had worked close to that pride for years and were quite used to the jeeps and anyone they brought with them. Indeed, the lions were not phased in the slightest, even though the jeeps were not even 10 feet away from them. The tourists were amazed at this and they all clamored together to get the best view of the beast and take all the pictures they could. One of the guides hopped out of the jeep, carrying a bucket with him. The group was confused, but he had a huge grin. He put the bucket down and announced that he would feed the lions. He pulled out a large hunk of meat and threw it at the male of the pride, who immediately started to eat. He moved forward, sat next to one of the female lions, and told the group that one person could come out and see the lions up close. At first, both of the jeeps were deathly silent, and no one dared to volunteer. But the silence was broken by the Finns laughing and speaking in their language, followed by one of them jumping out of the jeep and walking toward the guide. It was Ulrich. The guide put his hand up and told him to walk slowly. He did, but a bit more serious than before. He took careful steps and got close to the guide before kneeling and admiring the lions. As the guide talked to Ulrich, he suddenly stopped talking widened his eyes and told him to slowly stand up and start walking back to the jeep. Ulrich was confused, but he did as the guide ordered. As he stood up, he realized the danger they were in. A lioness surrounded by cubs was staring directly at him. Lionesses are notoriously protective of their cubs, and the ferocity of a threatened lioness is comparable to that of a mother bear. Although Ulrich did not know this, he understood the glare as a warning to back off. As Ulrich and the guide inched back, he noticed that the lioness was also moving forward, but they could not understand why. Outstretched hands holding cameras entering Ulrich's vision made everything clear. More people left the jeeps, 
Among them was one of Ulrich's friends, Lars. He was smiling and talking as if nothing was wrong, and just as Ulrich turned his head, imploring Lars and the others to back off, two lionesses charged forward, growling and showing no signs of stopping. The group that left the jeeps quickly fell back and made for the vehicles again, but Lars was not one of the lucky ones to reach the jeeps. As Ulrich crashed into the back of the jeep, he immediately stood up to see his friend screaming as the lioness pinned him down. If it were any other occasion, the beast would have probably bitten into him and backed off. But since there were cubs involved, everything ended with a swift bite to the nape of Lars's neck. The lioness returned to her cubs and laid down, still looking toward the jeeps. Ulrich stood in silence as the rest of the group screamed at the sight. He didn't know how to process what he had seen. After a few minutes, he broke into sobs as the guides told everyone to calm down. The jeeps started back up, and Lars was wrapped in a tarp. It was a somber, silent trip back to the meeting point. Ulrich had no idea what to do, and Franz, his other friend, was just as traumatized. They ended up calling the authorities who contacted Lars's family. They flew to Zimbabwe a few days later and returned to Finland to tend to Lars. They never really recovered from the incident, resulting in them cutting contact a few months later. Ulrich never traveled outside of Finland again. Their story serves as a reminder of the power of nature and the maternal instincts of wild animals and that conflict should always be avoided as you can never know what a wild animal could do. Naveen, Banjit, Mira, and Sonia were zoology students at a university in India. Despite being different, the four had shared an interest in studying animals in all shapes and sizes. Their tasks to investigate the existence of Asiatic lions, which exclusively reside in India. They are a species of endangered lions, and only hundreds can be found in the wild. Currently, most Asiatic lions are being protected by a wildlife sanctuary in Gujarat, India, where locals and tourists can come and see the lions up close. Naveen, Banjit, Mira, and Sonia immediately headed to the wildlife sanctuary to study Asiatic lions. Upon arriving at the park, they were greeted by the friendly staff and were asked about their concerns. Banjit cheerfully told the team that they wanted to study Asiatic lions and would ask permission to take them on a safari trip to get photo and video documentation about the animals. The staff agreed and sent Dhruv, one of the guides in the park, to accompany the students on their safari trip. Dhruv and the students will be riding in an open-air safari jeep so they can see the lions up close and take clear documentation about them. After orienting and making the students aware of the safety rules, the driver hopped onto the vehicle with Dhruv and the four students riding in the open-air backside of the jeep. Mira and Banjit agreed to be the ones taking down notes, while Naveen and Sonia were the ones to take photos and videos for their study. The students then entered the protected area through a jungle trail, where Asiatic lions can mostly be found. The students were amazed at how protected the place is, indicating that these lions are endangered and need protection other than their own strength. As their vehicle drives further into the trail, Several Asiatic lions can be found walking and resting on the ground, which Naveen and Sonia had been able to capture perfectly with their handheld cameras. They even saw Asiatic lion cubs and were happy that these lions had the time to reproduce and regain their numbers. The vehicle sometimes stopped to give way to the lions crossing the road or blocking the way. This gives the students more time to capture and record the behavior and information of these animals. On the other hand, Dhruv helps the students by giving them additional animal information to write in their study. After roaming the area for at least an hour, the students were satisfied with their findings, and Dhruv decided that they should head back so the students can go home. As they were heading back, they encountered a rough road, which caused the jeep to shake as they accelerated through the trail. The students and Dhruv all hung to the bars surrounding the sides of the jeep so they wouldn't fall off. Sitting close to the edge of the vehicle, Naveen found it hard to balance himself, so he stood up and looked for something to cling to. 
As he stood up, he lost balance and fell from the jeep, which terrified the others. Mira screamed, which alerted the lions surrounding them in the area. Droof says they shouldn't panic since the lions could feel threatened, but it was too late. As they checked on Naveen, his back was hurt badly, and he couldn't climb back into the vehicle. Groove and Banji stretched their arms out and reached for Naveen, but they felt horror when a lion bit Naveen's leg and started dragging him away. Dhruv and Banji hold on to Naveen's arms as the lion wants to pull him out, telling him he should try to kick the lion with his other free leg. Naveen felt his body hurt even more as he felt himself being stretched by Dhruv, Banji and the lion. He could also feel the lion's teeth piercing against his skin and pawing his legs to mutilate him. Sonia told the driver to move the vehicle closer to Naveen so he wouldn't get stretched out, which the driver did. It was a tug of war between Dhruv, Banjit, and the lion that wants Naveen for dinner. Naveen tries his best to kick the lion's face with his other free leg till he manages to kick it repeatedly while the lion still attempts to drag him away from Dhruv and Banjit. Dhruv and Banjit's arms were already worn out, but they were determined to save Naveen from danger. Mira immediately thought it was best for the vehicle to drive forward to save Naveen. On the other hand, Naveen feels his body burn as the lion still bites and paws his legs and lower body. After all the pulling Dhruv and Banjit had to do to save him, the driver decides to drive the vehicle forward to lose the lion. As the vehicle drives forward, Naveen is pulled out from the lion's grasp and carried back into the jeep by Dhruv and Banjit in no time. Naveen then fell unconscious as they returned to take the student to the nearest hospital. His legs were severely injured, but doctors confirmed he could still walk again with proper treatment. After the incident, the wildlife sanctuary temporarily closed to guarantee the safety of the visitors and the well-being of the resident lions. The story is set in Tanzania, specifically in Lukumburu, in the Njombe district. Femi Abioi, a 46-year-old farmer, was tending to his flock of sheep one day in August of 1999 when he was attacked by a hungry female lion that wandered into their village. It was an unusually warm morning, and Femi was talking to his wife about what to get from the market, and they arrived at the topic of their sheep. She insisted they should not be taken outside as it was too warm, but Femi told her they needed to walk and graze, at least for a short while, no matter the weather. She agreed to his insistence and departed for the market. With no transportation, it would be a long walk to the market and back, and at least a few hours. Femi went on with his day as usual, had a meal, and set out to put his sheep to pasture. It was a small flock, but it worked well for wool and meat whenever they needed it. He went to the small stables near their house and called for the sheep to come out. They were used to his voice and came immediately, after which Femi guided them to a pasture a few minutes away. The walk to the pasture was short, and once the sheep were happily grazing, he was free to lie down in the comfortable shade of a tree, accompanied by a bottle of spirits. He also brought a small whittling knife with him. He liked to make small figurines in his free time to give to the children in the village. The next two hours were spent in relative peace, with the occasional need to guide a stray sheep back to the flock. Sitting back down in the shade, he noticed a disturbance among the sheep. They were jittery and seemed to move to one side of the field, save for one. As Femi tried to figure out what was scaring his sheep, he stood up to look around. A blazing shape came crashing through the small outcropping of trees and tackled the lone sheep to the ground. He cleared his eyes and realized that a lone lioness had wandered upon his flock and was taking on sheep for itself. He steeled his mind, picked up his crook, and ran in the opposite direction. He valued his sheep, but he knew he had no business trying to contest a lion with its food. He had seen enough cases of people doing something like that and failing miserably. As he ran, he looked behind himself to find the lion staring intently at him. Something to note about big cats is that they have a strong prey drive and will usually attack anything with their back turned to them. Femi knew this and figured the lion would be happy with its prize and leave it be. It stood up, never taking its eyes off Femi. 
As it let go of the sheep in its mouth, it broke into a charge. Femi was terrified of the lion's sudden change in behavior and screamed as he tried to run faster. The lion was quicker. Femi could hear the growling behind him as he saw his house within reach. It was barely 20 yards from them. The view of his house was snuffed out by the sight of the dirt path meeting his face as the lion caught up and tackled him. He instinctively pulled his arms up to the nape of his neck and tried to curl up. Femi could feel the lion's hot breath on his hands as his claws ran straight from his shoulder to his lower back. He screamed in agony as blood sprayed through his white shirt and onto the ground. He looked up, but there was no one to be seen. The lion continued assaulting his back, and Femi knew he had to act quickly. His whittling knife was still in his left front pocket, so he quickly let go of his nape, snagged the knife, and flung his arm backward. He could feel the fur on his hand as the lion growled in protest, and it let him go just long enough for Femi to slip out from under it and break into another sprint. He reached the front of his house and crashed through the front door, quickly closing it behind him. He could hear the thumping of paws on the ground and scratching on his front door, but it was securely shut. He looked through the window and saw the lion, but it didn't see him. It started walking back to the flock and the sheep it caught, and Femi saw the whittling knife sticking out of the beast's side. He sighed in relief and went to unlock the door. He saw his wife returning from the market in the distance and waved to her to hurry. She saw her husband folded up in front of their house and hurried to help him, leaving the groceries behind. She ushered him into the house and tended his wounds with bandages and disinfectant, but they did need a doctor. She went out to fetch the village doctor and informed him about the situation. After notifying more men in the village, he immediately went to tend to Femi, who came to chase the lion off. They arrived as soon as possible, but the lion was already gone. Femi ended up recovering from his wounds as they were not too severe, but he never went to tend his flock without a friend in tow. Theo has worked as a handler at a wildlife park in South Africa for many years, and he has worked long enough to raise a lion named Junior ever since he was a cub. Junior was born with his two other siblings who died of a disease. He was the only one left who made the wildlife park management let a handler take care of him, and thus they got Theo to do the job. Raising a cub wasn't easy, but Theo enjoyed every moment with Junior. Junior was playful and energetic as a cub, and sometimes Theo couldn't keep up. But at the same time, Junior was a loving and affectionate cub, making him special. Theo and Junior's bond made the wildlife park's number of visitors increase over time. Thousands of locals and tourists visited the park to witness Theo playing and caring for the cub. They were amazed by Theo's bravery, love for the cub, and Junior's obedience to his handler. Their bond was so exceptional that they were featured in local newspapers and visited by journalists and personalities. Junior would greet those who visit him with a cheerful attitude that not all can see in other lions. Junior learned how to do simple and basic tricks to impress visitors when he was four years old. He also learned to obey Theo completely, which amazed others even more. Unfortunately, Junior attacked Theo when he was six years old while in a feeding session and ended up injuring Theo's arm. The handler was then sent to a hospital for months of treatment. The lion was moved into a more secluded enclosure to ensure he won't harm anybody again. As word spread that Junior had attacked his handler and had been relocated to another chamber, the park's usual number of visitors decreased. When Theo fully recovered from his injury a few months later, he insisted on seeing Junior since he missed the lion. Even though the lion injured him months ago, he still wants to return to work alongside him. Afraid of not getting recognized and being attacked by the lion, Theo was accompanied by a guard holding a rifle in case the lion might not recognize and attack him. As he enters the enclosure, he takes a deep breath and sees Junior sitting quietly and looking at him. Theo opens his arms wide and smiles at the lion, even though deep inside he is very nervous about Junior's reaction after not seeing him for so long. 
Unexpectedly, Junior runs and jumps at Theo to snuggle with him. Theo was delighted to see Junior recognizing him after a long time. The two of them played with each other and did tricks until it was time for him to say goodbye and leave the enclosure to rest. As soon as Theo was about to leave the chamber, something unexpected and terrifying happened. As soon as Theo was about to leave the enclosure, Junior ran to him again and pounced him from behind, making him collapse to the ground with his face first. Theo started to get annoyed, so he lay down on his back and tried to push the lion away. Instead of backing away, Junior suddenly roared as he felt threatened by Theo's gesture. He began to paw his handler and bite him on the head, causing Theo to scream in pain. The guard accompanying him called for backup immediately before aiming his rifle at the lion. Theo still tries to call Junior's name, but the lion doesn't mind anymore. Junior still attacks and paws him on the face, shoulders, arms, and upper body. Theo screams for help and looks at the guard, telling him to put Junior down as soon as possible. The guard hesitated until other handlers arrived and were horrified by the situation. The guard knew of Theo and Junior's bond ever since he was a cub and was silently contemplating whether he should put the lion down or risk his life to save Theo from the lion with his bare hands. Theo shouts at him and tells him to put the lion down once again, and the guard had already made the hardest choice he could ever think of. Theo cries out in pain at being attacked and knowing his favorite animal companion would be shot dead soon. A gunshot was heard and Junior collapsed lifelessly on top of him. The other handlers from outside rushed to help the severely wounded Theo and carried him outside, leaving Junior inside his enclosure, lifeless. After successfully moving Theo to the hospital, they all teared up, realizing that the lion they always knew as loving and caring had been taken down quickly. Theo, unfortunately, had to again spend months in the hospital to recover from the severe attack that he experienced from Junior. He miraculously survived the attack, but was saddened to know that his companion that he raised was gone forever, and he would no longer hold him in his arms, just like in the old times. <laughs>